Welcome uh, to the IISS uh, this afternoon. Uh, for purposes of the video recording taking place, uh, my name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I'm the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the IISS. For over a decade, the Pakistan Army has been operating in its federally administered tribal agencies and frontier regions adjacent to Afghanistan. This initially took place in support of the US war against terrorism to target Al-Qaeda militants. Since then, this has transformed into a campaign primarily against elements of the Pakistan Taliban that are carrying out an insurgency against the Pakistan state. While attempts at peace talks with the Pakistan Taliban have stalled, most notably earlier this week, there is now once again considerable speculation of a major Pakistan army offensive in the last of the seven tribal agencies of North Pakistan in the next few weeks or months. The withdrawal of NATO combat forces from Afghanistan within the next 10 months perhaps imposes a time frame for such a major Pakistani counterinsurgency operation. It is therefore timely to have a discussion meeting today on the Pakistan Army's operations in the tribal areas. And I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker Colonel Zulfikar Ali Bhatti, the Army and Air Advisor at the Pakistan High Commission in London. Colonel Bhatti was Chief of Staff of an infantry brigade in North Pakistan in 2007 and more recently commanded his regiment in Deer near the Afghan border in 2012-2013. I must add that when I was at the UK Defence Academy at Shivanam a few days ago, I was delighted to see Colonel Bhatti's name there as then a major in the Pakistan Army in the role of honor at the top of the International Students Officer Carter of the 12th Advanced Command and Staff Course at Shivanam. Colonel Bhatti has agreed to speak on the record for his formal presentation with the Q&A session being off the, record, off the record. This recording that's currently be taking place will therefore end before the Q&A session begins. Colonel Bhatti, please. Right. First of all, I would like to uh, thank Rahul and WIWS for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak here today. I would also like to thank all of you for taking our time to come here and listen to what I have to say today. Uh, the sequence in which I shall cover my talk is that, first of all, I'll give you some of the reasons why I decided to uh, do the talk today. From there onwards, I'll move to a very broad rundown of Pakistan Army's operations in the tribal areas and the Malakand Agency, uh, which will then lead on to uh, some of my personal experiences uh, which I've had uh, after serving there in North Waziristan Agency in 2007 and more recently in, uh, just before I came for this job, uh, commanding my regiment in Lower Deer area adjacent to the Afghan border. And what I intend doing uh, with this talk is that I would try and break down some of the prevalent myths that have actually come to be taken as, as the truth. And if time permits, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the future as well. But if not, then we can actually do that within the <clears throat> Q&A session. Uh, I've been here for about six months now, and I've attended many uh, talks, lectures, conferences. And I've actually been quite taken aback by some of the prevalent narrative, which in most part is based on myths, misperceptions, half-truths, and I hate to say that, but uh, sometimes just totally, uh, you know, false, falsified facts. And especially about the role the Pakistan Army has played in the war on terror. And also, uh, there's a surprisingly acute misunderstanding about the conflict itself and its dynamics. And I think one of the reasons for that is that most of these talks that I've, I've been to are given by uh, so-called experts who unfortunately haven't even been to Pakistan what to talk about these conflict hit areas. And a, as they say, you know, that if you copy from one source, that's plagiarism. And if you copy from many sources, that's called research. So that, that's the kind of research that is, that is prevalent. And what's happened, the, one of the reasons, uh, another reason is that there's a dearth of well-researched reference material on this subject. Uh, what is available is poorly researched, I feel, lacking personal interaction or experience. And what this leads to uh, is the churning out of the same distorted narrative, which is increasingly being accepted as the truth in the absence of an effective challenge. 
And that is one reason that I am here uh, today. <clears throat> I must admit that most of my talk will focus on the tactical and the operational level. But uh, what I hope to do is that from this, we will lead into a, a strategic Q&A session the, where we can have a, a more candid and, and frank discussion. Uh, so moving on, uh, first of all, uh, to the Pakistan Army's operations broadly in the tribal areas. But before I do that, I'll just want to give you a sense of the, of the geography. Uh, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is about 2,600 kilometers long, starting from Mintaka Pass in Gilgit Agency down to uh, Rabat in Balochistan. And if you see the red circle, that shows uh, the southernmost edge of the South Waziristan Agency, which is the last of the, of the tribal areas. And if you translate this into a, a graph, you can actually see the heights. So from Mintaka Pass down to South Waziristan Agency, you can see uh, the varying heights. So South Waziristan, North Waziristan, the heights go up to about seven to eight, 9,000 feet. Then you move to Kuram Agency with the famous Tora Bora, where you have heights about over 15,000 feet. Then you move to Deer and Bajor, where I was last year. The heights about 10 to 12,000 feet. And then obviously increasingly going up as we move uh, further northwards. And to give you a photographic view of how the terrain looks like, I'm sure many of you might have flown over. Some of you might have actually been quite uh, deployed, quite close to this area. But this gives you, gives you a sense of the kind of area we are talking about. Uh, just another snapshot of uh, how difficult this terrain is. So this terrain, I mean, you know, lends itself to guerrilla warfare. And it's very difficult for conventional forces uh, to operate in, in such areas, I th as I think all of us uh, know quite well. So on this border, how many posts do we have? Uh, Pakistan Army has about 3,500 posts on the complete border within which there are about 650 uh, border posts. If you see the area which is outlined by blue, that's the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, and the bright yellow is the federally administered uh, tribal areas. Moving on to the military operations. So what's the purpose? I think this very clearly states that proactively pursue the end objective of elimination of terrorists, and deny use of own territory as a sanctuary for operations within Pakistan or across the Pakistan-Afghanistan border through effective articulation of military, political, and development measures so as to achieve comparative peace. What, are the, what is the concept which has been given by the general headquarters of the, of the Pakistan Army? And that is the military operations have to be acceptable to the public at large with political ownership the convergence of military and political components of the strategy, I think that's the key. Adequate regard to geography, history, and culture of the area. Use of minimum force for minimum time. Reduce own and exploit the terrorist vulnerabilities. Enhance public confidence in the armed forces and progressively limit the terrorists to specific areas before their eventual elimination. And coordinate operations as far as possible with ISAF for maximum effects. And I would urge you to take a note of the last point as, as we move forward. <clears throat> so this is the Pakistan uh, military's troop deployment figure. At, uh, at current numbers, we've had about, uh, we now have about 158,000 troops deployed on the western border, 100,000 out of which are the regular army, and about 60,000 are uh, the frontier corps. And uh, just compare and contrast it with with 2001 when we had about 40,000 troops. So this is what we call the silent surge. But what have these operations, uh, you know, uh, how have they been conducted? Uh, you can see we've actually conducted uh, good about s over 7,500 operations in the last uh, decade or so. And two of these operations have been large core size operations, one of which uh, was in Sawat, and the other one was in the South Waziristan Agency, both of which uh, were very successful uh, military operations. So what have these operations achieved? Uh, so if you take a note of this slide, 
Uh, the green, obviously, uh, are the areas where there was strong, and this is 2007-8, where the government, strong government control. The yellow shows, obviously, there was a contested control, and red are, were those areas where the, you know, the Taliban or the terrorists, you know, held sort of, you know, they were very strong uh, in these areas. So where do we stand today? So you can see a lot of the yellows and the reds have been replaced by the green, but this is something which is which is not really known, doesn't really come out. This is what the military has achieved in the last uh, seven to eight, uh, about seven years, I would say. And the only areas now left are a little bit uh, Tira Valley in Khyber Agency and parts of North Waziristan uh, Agency. Uh, the remaining areas uh, remain green. This does not mean that there is no single incident in these areas. This just means that the government and the military have a strong writ in these areas. We still have small little incidents here and there, but the control remains uh, firmly with us. And within the process, there have been about 27,000, and this figure is correct up to December 2013, uh, terrorists who have been killed, injured, or captured. But obviously, all of this has come at a cost. And that cost, financially, as per the government of Pakistan's estimates, We've lost, we've lost about 100 billion U.S. dollars in the last uh, 10 to 11 years. And the cost of war on the western border is about $2 billion annually for the military operations that we undertake, which is, which is quite substantial. We've had about 56,000 soldiers uh, and civilians killed or injured. And this includes one three-star, three two-stars, and five one-star general officers. And two of these two-star general officers uh, were actually general officers commanding of their divisions uh, in operations. And this is, as you all understand, is, is, is unprecedented. If you look at the other side, it's quite unprecedented. We haven't had this kind of a record uh, in, in any other military in recent years. Uh, and I might like to add here that the ratio between officer and soldier killed is about, is about 11, which is probably, again, I'm sure it's the highest in the world which obviously you know, gives you a sense of uh, the involvement of the officers, uh, Carter, in this, in this conflict. Coming to the, just the military, we've had about over 4,000 people killed and 13,000 injured. 1,500 out of these people have been uh, critically injured and cannot uh, return to uh, active duty. A lot of talk goes on about you know, the, the, the ISI and the militant links and so I just wanted to show you a few photographs. Uh, this is the photograph of the ISI headquarter, uh, which was targeted uh, in 2009 in, in Lahore. Uh, this is the ISI headquarters uh, in Peshawar. And this was the ISI headquarters in uh, Multan. Uh, so sh seeing these pictures, you can pretty easily make out who do the uh, terrorists consider their enemy number one, and it is the ISI, actually. And that's why it's being regularly targeted. These are just few incidents out of many that have happened against the inter-services intelligence. This gives you a sense of the, uh, the infrastructure damage. So I've just taken out the number of the schools that have been destroyed or damaged, which is about over 1,000, a, a most of them uh, in, in the Swat Valley, nearly 500. I must hasten to add that we have actually managed to reconstruct uh, most of these schools, and hopefully the remaining will also be reconstructed and renovated in the, in the times to come. I've talked about the kinetic operations. I would also like to talk about a little bit about the, the VAM campaign, or the winning hearts and minds campaign, and the military people like to call it, which is basically the non-kinetic side of it. And I think uh, we've adopted a troop a two-pronged strategy, which includes development and de-radicalization. Within the developments, I'll just give you some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, figures, really, that, uh, of how uh, this development has taken place, and just give you a few, few photographs, which will give you a sense. So QUIPS stands for Quick Impact Projects. So there is a very wide spectrum of what is being done and has been done, it includes roads, schools, hospitals, health centers, water supply, electricity, bridges, and all of this obviously in the conflict hit uh, areas. This is the road tank Gomalwana, which is in South Wazistan, uh, 
which has been recently been completed. Uh, this again is South Waziristan, what it was before, what it looks like today. Uh, this is one of the bridges in the Suwat Valley. Uh, this is a training center for the women, again in Suwat. This is a degree college for women. This is a hospital in the South, uh, sorry, in Bajor Agency. This is a hospital again in South Waziristan Agency. And uh, all of these have been constructed by the 45 Engineers Division or the Frontier Works Organization, both of which are military organization. And we all understand because the security situation is such that it is the military only at the moment we can act which can actually do this kind of a development activity. And that's why uh, I think we've, we've, we've done that. Moving on to the de-radicalization efforts. Again, I won't go into the details because this would require a separate, I think, uh, presentation. Uh, but basically, the concept has been that because these young people have mostly been brainwashed on religious lines, so the de-radicalization process also has to be based on religious lines. So we've, what we've done is uh, sort of got uh, very reputed scholars, uh, psychiatrists who've gone to these DRAD centers and have actually weaned away these people from uh, the life of violence through, by using the correct perspective, giving them the correct perspective of religion. And I think it's been quite successful. Uh, this is just a photograph of Sabaun, which is a juvenile uh, uh, de-radicalization center. So the, the top half shows how the students or how the kids looked when they came in, and the bottom half shows how they were uh, when they were near to the passing out or uh, completing their time at the uh, Sabaud. Just a few international visitors' perspectives. I'll, I'll let you read that. Uh, the first one, obviously, was given by the EU ambassador uh, to Pakistan, uh, who visited the center in 2012. Uh, the bottom one, uh, by, given by Dr. Peter Levoy, who's from the Department of Defense uh, in the United States. And this was, again, in December uh, 2012. Yeah, just I'll give you feelers and indicators. You know, I can actually show you like a hundred more slides like that. But just just to give you a feeler of uh, what has been done, how it's been done, how it is being done. Just a word on the rehabilitation efforts, which we feel in, and uh, in the military are really important for keeping the morale of the uh, you know, soldiers high. Uh, and we've come a long way since we established the Armed Forces Institute of Rehabilitative Medicine in 2007, so there's been over uh, 300 upper and lower limb prostheses which have been uh, carried out in the institute. Uh, just a sports, photographs of a sports gala which was arranged at this institute uh, uh, last year. Uh, our ex-chief of the army staff, General Kiani, obviously going there and showing his solidarity with the troops. Uh, but what's really encouraging for the Pakistani military, I think, is, is that we haven't had any of these participants on antidepressants. We haven't had any case, cases of suicide uh, during these operations. So this is something which gives a lot of confidence uh, to the military hierarchy and to people like me who have commanded uh, regiments in uh, operations. I'd now move on to my experiences. And by sharing my experiences, I'll also try and bring down some of the myths that have become prevalent over the years. So first of all, North Waziristan Agency. I was the chief of staff of an infantry brigade uh, there in 2007. Uh, and I was looking after the north and the northwestern parts of the, of the border with, with Afghanistan, which is the host province on the Afghanistan side. Uh, you know, the, one of the myth number two, as I call it, is that there is no army deployed in North Waziristan Agency. That's some of the people that I've heard have talked about this. In 2007, we had four infantry brigades, which is a division plus side strength, and four to five wings of Frontier Corps, which were deployed in North Waziristan Agency in 2007. And I'm sure the numbers must have gone up as we talked about the silent surge. By now, the numbers must be, uh, must be uh, higher than what they were in 2007. Myth number three, the Pakistan Army has not conducted any operation in North Waziristan Agency. Well, I was chief of staff of an infantry brigade, and I can assure you that we conducted numerous operations, albeit at a relatively smaller scale, like battalion minus scale, 
but many operations were carried out in North Wazirstan Agency, and that is why you see it as yellow and not red today. And these operations, especially there was a peace agreement uh, till about July 2007. So the first half of my time, we had a peace agreement. But since July till December 2007, when the Red Mosque operation took place and the peace agreement uh, was, uh, was broken, we had uh, a spike in operations. And there were significant casualties on both sides, including from my own uh, brigade and regiments. So there were a lot of operations carried out in North Wazirstan Agency. But this is something which is not really, uh, not really known. <clears throat> and if, obviously, I haven't got any slides for those operations. If Rahul would have given me more time, I could have actually you know, dug deep into my archive back home in Pakistan and gotten some slides and you know, more details of the operations. But obviously, uh, some other day, Rahul. Um, right, myth number four, that the army allows cross-border movement into Afghanistan. I'll answer it in two parts. Part number one. If you have a look at every single peace deal that the military has inked with the militants, one of the top clauses within this uh, agreement has been that the militants will not cross over into Afghanistan. So even when you went for a peace deal, this was very much part of the deals. And you can have a look at all the peace deals that have been, uh, have been conducted. <clears throat> and in the second part, I had very clear instructions and in turn, as a chief of staff, I had given very clear orders to my troops, which were deployed on the borders, that there was to be no cross-border movement from my area of responsibility. And this included the main road link, which is Ghulam Khan area. And I was looking after that. And this, this was true in 2007. And the same orders were repeated to me in no uncertain terms while I was commanding my regiment in Lower Deer area, that there was to be no cross-border movement. I will now move on to the Lower Deer area, next part of my personal experiences. This is where I commanded my regiment. If you see from uh, second from the top, the Lower Deer area, this is where I was commanding my regiment uh, till about uh, uh, June last year before I took over this job. And within this, what I want to do, I've talked a lot about the military operations. I will give you a sense of the non-kinetic efforts you know, and the hearts and minds facet of, of my campaign. How, as a commanding officer, what steps did I feel I needed to take and I did take for making sure that we had an enduring peace and not just a short term? So I will focus more on the, on the non-kinetic side of it. The most important thing is what is the narrative? What narrative do you give? So within my interaction with the jirgas, in interactions with the people, these are the main thread lines. So I, I tended to highlight it, highlight the un-Islamic actions of the Taliban to discredit them on religious and social lines underscore the immense damage which has been done by the Taliban to the image of Islam world over. The Pakistan army is not a foreign army and has no deadline to leave. We will stay here as long as it takes to achieve peace in the area. The Taliban cannot achieve victory over the Pakistan army. They, will ha they have limited capability restricted to carrying out small level actions which will never deter the army but will only result in increased hardships for the local population. Complete and final victory over the Taliban or the terrorists can only be achieved through support of the local population, and it is in their be best interest to render this support to the army. The army's primary role is to usher peace and security and provide a safe and conducive environment for other governmental agencies to then kick in and carry out their, their work. And the final solution to the problem is only achievable once public provide wholehearted support. Otherwise, the issue will fester for years and the main sufferers, obviously, will be the public. So these were the, this was the narrative which I built for myself, which I was always uh, propagating in my time there. And these might appear to be quite trivial activities, but I just wanted to enumerate these, that these are the kinds of things that we were also doing apart from the kinetic operations. So there were jirgas, so there was renovation and construction of schools, and this was at a, at a local unit level with the help of the locals, so giving funding from them, donations from them, constructing schools, medical, free medical camps, cleanliness drives. Uh, we made sure there was a national anthem played in the madrasas, and there was a national flag displayed in each madrasa. Uh, we organized sports festivals. A very important thing, I think, that we did was we carried out, uh, we delivered lectures. Myself and my officers would go to schools, colleges, 
uh, in the area and deliver talks to them, to the youth, to the students, to you know, wean, away, uh, wean them away from the, from the extremist ideology. We also held various carders for the local children, uh, distribution of sports uh, kits in schools, and the last, which was vacancies in army public school. I made a lot of efforts to get free educational vacancies for kids and young people, bright young people of that area. They could then go and study in various army schools that are spread all over Pakistan uh, with free boarding, free tuition, free lodging. So this is, I think, uh, something which, is, which has a long-term effect. And I'll just show you a few photographs of what we did. This is the sports complex that we, create, uh, we made uh, in the area. Uh, this is one of the schools that we did with, with our own funding. Uh, another school, this is a very distant uh, area, uh, primary school. Uh, this is a, a, a children's park. This concept just did not exist. So we provided a children's park to the area where the kids could come and have a good time in, uh, in, the, in the leisure time. Uh, free medical camps, uh, you know, going to the cleanliness drive that I talked about. Uh, shifting of bus stand from the main cities outside, outside the uh, main bazaar and the market. So these might appear to be trivial things, but when you join them together, when you combine, you know, the larger impact, the population is not just then focused on terrorism and extremism. It begins to live a normal life, and this is what we, what we, what we want you to achieve. Uh, sports festivals, schools and college lectures, as, as I've talked about, celebration of Pakistan Day, qaid e azam Day in, in, in the schools. Uh, these, these are some of the cadres that I've talked about. Uh, this, you know, the jirga is, is a key. It's a very important aspect of, of the culture of the tribal areas and you know, in the Malakand Agency. I would have regular, I would go down to the post and have regular jirgas with these uh, people. Uh, can you play the video, please, Tom? this is one of my posts, so obviously you would not understand the language. Most of you, I, I know my Indian friends would. Um, so just give, give you a sense of you know, how, how, how we will be doing these things. But these are pretty unknown things. And next, please. <clears throat> And then just a very short clip of one of the sports festivals. Uh, you, you'll see people in AC Milan kits, in shorts. And uh, uh, you might also, uh, if, if, if we can play the video. Next one, please. And music in the background. This will give you a sense of, you know, the, the gradual change that we, we were bringing in the area. People wearing shorts, ASIM land kits, music in the background. I think this, this was something which was, uh, was really important. I think I, I, I personally felt very satisfied once we, we had come to this stage. Uh, next, please. I'll now move on to what I call the myth number. Was it six or seven? Seven, probably. OK. <laughs> uh, Cross-water attacks. Uh, I think there's a lot of talk about the cross-water attacks going from the Pakistani side into Afghanistan. But there's hardly any talk about the other side. Uh, in the Deer and Bajor and Momand areas, uh, we've been under attack quite frequently. Uh, so this shows you the area. And this will give you an ac uh, the actual picture. I think since uh, even 2010, We've had 15 major attacks. And when I say major attacks, I think it's been between an average strength of 150 uh, to 200. And I think both sides, the, uh, the figures of people killed, I think, has been about 300. So this will give you a sense of 
you know, something, there is something which goes on from the other side as well, which is obviously not really uh, talked about. And th this was us, myself responding to one of such attacks which happened in August, September um, of 2012, which was in the Bajor area. So, you know, this, these are realities which have to be obviously uh, to be understood and, and known when you talk about this uh, conflict. And what I'll do is I'll end my personal experiences with this slide. The reason I show this slide is that this was an IED attempt against uh, you know, uh, my vehicle as I moved up from the post, which is in the background. I was coming down. So the people that you see on the side, these people stopped me well short of this point and, and said that while they were traveling down, they had say, seen somebody planting or trying to plant an IED. And after seeing this, the person had run away. So they stopped me and said, be careful, first check the area, then go forward. I think that was a one incident which brought confidence to me that we were winning. Because if the locals with, it, with us were warning of this kind of a thing, I think this is something which, which sent a very strong message uh, to me. <clears throat> I said I'll talk about the future direction. Uh, sort of, uh, I think we are on time. Uh, what are we looking at in the future? I think. The end state is that we want the elimination of terrorists and their facilitators. We want the strengthening of political and administrative institutions in the federally administered tribal areas. We want creation of a development-friendly environment for sustained development and bringing about socioeconomic change and the integration of FATA into the national mainstream. I think one positive that we can take from this whole conflict, uh, there's actually two, but one of them is that we'll hopefully be able to bring FATA into the mainstream, which we haven't done for the last 60 years. So that's one positive. The other positive is that the Pakistan military is now, is now very well trained. And we say we, we have to, we owe this to Hakimullah and Baitullah Masood for making sure that the Pakistan army is now a very well trained uh, fighting unit. So th this is something again, which, which can, you know, one good thing which can come out of this. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges. Uh, these are the hopes, and, but these are the challenges then. We have, as you all know, a troubled economy. Uh, it'll be a challenge to sustain the military operations beyond 2014. Improving our bilateral relations with Afghanistan has always been a challenge. We've, uh, the things are improving, and we hope to take them uh, in a better direction in the future. Uh, facilitate the ISAF and US drawdown, especially in the context of the ground lines of communication. That's something which, which is very, very important for us. Uh, stability of Afghanistan after 2014 is a big question mark. I think Pakistan is worried. Uh, Pakistan is probably the most worried country when it comes to this. We hope to see a very uh, stable and prosperous Afghanistan, but obviously uh, the future is not very predictable. And then uh, finally, if we want to achieve a holistic peace and, and stability in the area, and we need to remove the impediments uh, that we've seen so frequently come uh, uh, to the Pakistan-U.S. relations in the last few years. I think that is, that is, uh, that is the key. So I'd like you to consider the following before I conclude. <clears throat> Pakistan's strength of about 158,000 on our side of the border, as opposed to about 100,000 troops on the other side, which might have actually reduced by now. I don't have the uh, figures now. Tali might, or Joe might uh, give me a better figure. Uh, we've got about 645 border posts uh, on this side of the border, as opposed to about 200 on the other side. So this is important when you link to cross-border movement, who's responsible, who does what. Uh, the Pakistan military's uh, counter ID expenditure is only about 80 million US dollars per annum. Compare this with US expenditure of about $4.2 billion per annum, which is nearly twice the total budget of Pakistan army itself. A soldier's average combat tenure, we've got about 30 months uh, tenure for our troops. Compare this with about six months, I think, for British officers, I think about 12 months, if, if I'm not wrong, for the, for the other countries, uh, US, I mean. Uh, We've got about 4,000 Pakistani troops have been killed in this war, and compare this with uh, about 3,500 fatalities on the other side for the combined nations uh, who are fighting in Afghanistan. 
So you can, you can see that Pakistan is committed to bringing peace in the region. The situation in Afghanistan beyond 2014 is uncertain. Pakistan military will be the only force available to provide that kind of a st stability, and we need to support that. And a peaceful resolution, ultimate peaceful resolution of the conflict is very closely and intricately linked uh, to a regional uh, solution. And before we move into the q and A, I'll, I'll leave you uh, with a question, and that is, why is this story not told? Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>